second person who is really inspiring me, my friend, Tim Shriver. <laughs> No, really, it's true. That's too bad. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Cecilia, what can I say? Boy, uh, I can't keep up with you, that's for sure. Uh, Richard and Cecilia, thank you for, uh, for those extraordinarily kind and generous words. Uh, Your Excellency, Sheikh Faisal, uh, we are so uh, pleased, uh, all of us in Special Olympics, to be with you um, and to share in these few moments. I, I want to also thank so many of the guests who are here, many of uh, the family of uh, Special Olympics leaders from around the world who are here. I think we have also a few athletes. I hope they are athletes who are not competing during these games, because otherwise you should be out at your venues. But if there are any Special Olympics athletes, former or future Special Olympics athletes in the room, I would be most grateful if you're comfortable standing and just uh, inviting uh, the audience here and the dignitaries here to recognize you. I see Frank and Dania. <laughs> Please stand. We have several of you. Thank you. Richard, my wife would be here to support me also this morning, except she's in the mini triathlon. And she left it. Uh, so sport is something you can talk about, but it's also, we have to remember, something you can do. Um, and she's off, uh, off at Long Beach this morning, but asked uh, me to share with you also her, uh, her kind comments and, and thanks for this convening. Um, Richard mentioned that we met a year ago uh, to discuss uh, how Special Olympics could contribute to the Doha goals in Doha. Um, but here you are. Uh, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, our movement is 47 years old. And in 47 years, we have never in our history had a gathering of sport leaders choose to convene on the occasion of our athletes coming together. Never has this type of gathering of leaders from sport, from business, from politics, from social sector, uh, come to our games. Uh, many times we've been asked to bring an athlete or, or to, to go to other gatherings and forums to speak, but never have people made the gesture of respect to our athletes to come uh, to be with us and to endure uh, our crazy, wild, and sometimes a little bit uh, loosey uh, and, uh, and um, uh, let's say casual structure, but come nonetheless uh, in, out of respect for our athletes. So from the bottom of my heart, Your Excellency, uh, uh, to all of the leadership in, in Qatar, I just want to say um, this is a first, and it's a very, very proud moment, and we are very grateful. I, I will not be able to fully express that to you personally, but I want you to know. So I, I'm here to uh, introduce a panel. Last night at the, sh at the uh, stadium, they, they said you can have 90 seconds uh, to give your speech. I think I went to two. If I was rushing, it was because I was so scared they were going to turn off the microphone. Um, in the middle of my speech, but I think I went over two minutes. Here they told me I had four minutes, and I think I'm already over. I'm seeing the clock already. Um, but I just want to say a few words by way of introducing our panel. Last night, for those of you who, who heard or saw, Tim Harris, uh, a Special Olympics athlete from Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, who introduced the, president, uh, introduced the president at the White House, but last night introduced the First Lady. I don't know if you heard him. He looked out at the field and he said, uh, people with intellectual differences are awesome. Now, yeah, it's true, right? It's true. But I, I want you to um, just take a moment to think about that statement and think um, how profoundly countercultural that is. Think how most of us are raised all of our lives uh, to believe that the one thing we don't want is to have an intellectual disability, that the one thing we would prefer not to have to face is a family member. And yet Tim stood up there and said, it's awesome. Now, the, the power of that statement, I think, is important for us to capture here today. Richard, you said when you go to Davos, you're there with people who think they're important. And I think they do. I think they really do. 10,000 people, they're extremely wealthy. They're very powerful. 
and they think they're very important. But the truth is that most people don't think they're important at all. Most of us think we're very unimportant. Most of us feel we're mostly invisible. Most of us feel nobody notices us. Uh, most of us feel like we've done something wrong in our lives that have put us in a situation where we don't belong. We're not going to be invited to a, a gathering uh, as distinguished as this. We don't belong in the important section. Most of us feel like the loser, if I can use a sport message. I hate to say it, but I think, I'm sad to say, I think it's true. And yet here we have an invitation from the Doha Goals to challenge the model of sport and take it away from those who are good to great in the eyes of others, those important people, and give it back to everyone so that we can shift the paradigm from not just sport as those we can eliminate and then lionize only one or two, and shift it to the paradigm of how we can make sport into something that includes everyone. If we're honest, ladies and gentlemen, we have to admit that in many situations, sport is not used to empower the vulnerable and the second place and the third place person. In fact, many of us can recount times when sport made us feel small, the last one picked on the team. Most people, I'm sad to say, stop playing sport before they reach the age of 21 because they've come to believe they don't, they're not good enough. We are here with a different message. We're here to say everybody is good enough. We're here to follow Tim Harris to say everybody can contribute. How many people would say, I'm really good at tennis? Most people say, oh, I'm not very good. Or I'm a great golfer. No, no, I'm not very good. No, no. Well, do you swim? Yeah, I swim. Are you good? No, no, I'm not very good. The message of this forum is, yes, you are good. Not only are you good, you are awesome. Everybody is awesome. If we make sport the vehicle, the communication tool, the teaching tool to empower people to feel that experience. I think in a divided world, in a world where the people who held that torch last night, uh, their leaders don't speak to each other, their leaders uh, throw accusations at each other, their politicians uh, raise armies to kill one another. And last night they carried a little flame, we call it the flame of hope, and they handed it to one another. Handing hope, no words, no policy statement, no bureaucrat. Uh, no uh, legislature to approve it, just one hand to another, hope to hope, flame to flame, person to person. You're awesome. Yes, you are too. And yes, you are too. You can play. Yes, you can too. And we can play together. So we are uh, so thrilled to be able to share a few moments this morning by way of a panel. And I'd like to ask each of you to think in your minds. Uh, in our world, we believe that Special Olympics and sport for all is a teacher. And the question sometimes people wonder is, well, what does it teach? What does sport teach? So I'm going to invite our panel to join me. And I'm going to invite them to join me with one question uh, to start our discussion. If you had a lesson you could teach the world through sport, what would it be? What would you like? the world to learn through the power of sport. So before we get our panel, let's have a little. Uh, the other thing is that sport is really, really good for video. Uh, <laughs> so let's have a short Special Olympics video, and then we'll, uh, then we'll bring up the panel. Thank you.
say. On the panel, joining us, uh, four people who need no introduction, but I'll do brief ones. Scott Hamilton, one of the greatest Olympic athletes in our history, one of the greatest humanitarians ever to leave the playing field to change the world for those suffering from health care conditions that others thought uh, would defeat him. Uh, a rising star still today in every possible way and a member of the International Board of Directors, uh, the great Scott Hamilton is the first speaker to my left. Soren Palumbo, the founder, the co-founder, I dare say, of the largest social engagement movement in the history of the Special Olympics movement, the campaign to end the use of intolerant, humiliating language all over the world, the use of the word retard and its fellow uh, words that humiliate people, uh, defective, in, imbecile, idiot, moron, the, this language that has dominated uh, languages all over the world. Soren, uh, with the inspiration of his sister and the collegiality of other folks in the Special Olympics movement, launched the Spread the Word to End the Word. It has reached over 100 countries, millions of signatures, and actually changed the popular perception of what it means to be respectful of people with intellectual difference. The great Soren Palumbo. <laughs> Dana Schiltz. Who joined, Dana Schultz joined uh, our movement some years ago. She'll get to talk about it. Uh, and most recently has starred in the X Games as uh, a snowboarder uh, par excellence, one of the most in, uh, endurance driven and most risk taking sports in the world. She joined Hannah Teeter this past year uh, for one of the great performances in snowboarding in the history of the Special Olympics and the X Games movement. Dana Schultz. And finally, yes. And finally, in the United States, for those of you not here, we have a very popular sport. It's called football. We don't play it with our feet. We play it with our hands. We throw the ball. We catch it. We're allowed to touch it. And nobody calls us for fouls. Um, uh, the, uh, the most distinguished, the most successful, uh, in arguably the greatest running back, the most difficult position in the world in uh, football is the position of running back. Um, the, arguably the greatest running back in the world today um, who, as he said last night, got his start. The first uniform he ever wore was the uniform of Special Olympics. We are so proud to welcome Jamal Charles to the stage. So, with that, um, we have uh, a little over a half an hour, and I will turn it over to you guys. Would, who would like to start um, to share maybe either a lesson that sport has taught you or a lesson you think sport uh, in the future could teach uh, our children the next generation? I, I, for me, it's um, everything's possible. Mm. It's not just anything's possible, everything's possible. You know, to um, find something you truly enjoy doing. Um, you know, they, they use buzzwords like hard work, determination, sacrifice. I mean, these all have kind of a negative feeling mm. to them, but it's more like commitment repetition, uh, the joy for what you're doing. And uh, those, those drive, I think, people in sport more than the other words do. Mm. So for me, it was just trying to be a little bit better tomorrow than I was the day before. Mm. And uh, just set short-term small goals um, that you know kind of pile up on each other over time. But um, just be a little bit better tomorrow doing something you truly love to do um, than you were today. Nice. Daniel, does that resonate with you? Does that is that how you approach sport, or do you have a different experience? Oh, that's totally how I approach a sport. Um, you only can get better; you never can get worse. Well, you can. But <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> you Wait till you get a little older. <laughs> you try to get better. Um, sport has taught me a whole bucket full of things to be, to exceed in something, and to go further in life. And when you're snowboarding track and field, um, aquatics, you are not competing for first, second, and third. You're competing for the finish. You're competing for the win and to feel good when you finish and to um, just feel great when you finish. And um, yeah. <laughs> nice, thank you. So when you say, can I just ask you to follow up a little bit there, when you say you're not competing for first or second or third, but for the finish, um, what's the finish feel like? The finish is amazing. Um, when I was in South Korea, um, 
I competed in snowboarding and it was advanced snowboarding. And it was me and two other women. We were the top three women in the advanced division of, of the world. And to come across for the first time ever in my life, which was my dream to go finish in the world games of anything. It didn't matter to me what it was. I was hoping it would be snowboarding. <laughs> but to finish, come across that finish line was just an unbelievable feeling. I didn't care what place I get. I didn't care what my time was. But <laughs> to be a part of a finish line that is a world was an unbelievable feeling for me. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Jamal, what's, um, you know, you're in the toughest, arguably the toughest sport in the world. Uh, tell us what it feels like for you. Uh, what it feels for, like for me is like sports gave me my first belief that I can do anything in, 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 in my life. Mm -hmm. It gave me my first chance to feel like I can be successful. Mm -hmm. Just not just playing football, running track, you know what I'm saying, going to the Junior Olympics. My first time I feel like I can make it in, in, my, in a life, mm -hmm. in, in this world. Mm -hmm. And it gave me hope. It gave me, gave me joy, you know what I'm saying? Because with sports, sports is just more than any other thing in the world. You can all, everybody can do sports, even though if you do media with sports, anything, you know what I'm saying? You feel comfortable when you, when you with sports, it's like a freedom. Right. Like you're just having fun, just freedom out there. And it, it, it teaches you about hard work, how to be equal, mm. how to include other people. Mm. And I have a foundation, and uh, my foundation is, uh, and it helped, it helped me want to help other people too. Mm. And, and that's what it is. I'm always about giving back and, and helping the young kids out because the kids are our future. Mm -hmm. The kids, we can't do nothing with the kids. So I got a foundation that helps with learning disability scholarships. Mm -hmm. So I give back as well. Nice. And, very, uh, nice. very nice, yeah. <laughs> so I just, with sports, you can do a lot with sports. And you know what I'm saying? With sports, it helped me finance my family mm -hmm. as well. Uh, it helped me learn as well, going to college, mm. you know what I'm saying, on the University of Texas, that's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, that's a big deal, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it teaches a lot, you know what I'm saying? That's how I got my scholarship. Right, right. So, you know what I'm saying, sports is the, the best thing in my life right now. And it tells, it, it teaches, it helps me a lot to teach other people as well. And I'm just excited that, uh, about being here at this event because uh, I was so scared, like I said, so scared and afraid to tell people I had a learning disability. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And once I broke that news out and, and I found out other people, right. you know what I'm saying, on my team, right. came out with a say, man, I had the same thing. Wow. So it feels good to get that, 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 that line, that, that, right. that monkey off my back. Yeah. And, and, and now I feel like I'm free to enjoy my life. Wow. Wow. Um, how many people want to get a monkey off their back? <laughs> I mean, most of us, most of us walk around, you know, and I think that's why your comments last night were so, for those of you, you're hearing Jamal speak so eloquently now, but um, when we first talked about Jamal uh, speaking at the Coliseum in front of 62,000 people, he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't, I can run, I can cut, you know, I can do all that, I don't, I, you know, but I mean, you killed it last night, you really did, it was powerful, it was beautiful, yeah. Thanks. So Soren, you're, you're, um, a newly minted JD, MBA, uh, newly married, uh, life taking off, um, but you've, you've grown up with looking at, um, at the issue of monkeys on people's backs, right. if I can use that language, your sister, your family, you know the experience of, uh, maybe you just tell a little bit about how you felt empowered at one point in your life to shift gears and say, I want to teach. Sure, I think that, so for everyone in the audience, I grew up with a, a younger sister with an intellectual disability, my sister, Olivia is now 20 years old, uh, falls in the autism spectrum. And throughout my life, I've had different educational opportunities, but by far the greatest teacher that I've ever had has been uh, my younger sister, Olivia. And to see the, the struggles that she's had, not because of any challenges in the classroom, but because of the stigma that's associated with intellectual disability in our society, has shown me an opportunity to improve her life to improve my life and improve the lives of millions of people around the world. I think that 
one thing that, that struck me, I heard the phrase once uh, in English, the phrase that familiarity breeds contempt and that when we're around the same people a lot, uh, we start to butt heads with them or we start to, to no longer see eye to eye with them. But I He's think- He's only been married at like two months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jenna. But- <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm happy to say sorry, that, that phrase sorry. is wrong. <laughs> that's, that's where I was going with this. Um, I, <laughs> I'm happy to say I'm learning. I'm learning the phrase is wrong. Uh, so in English, the phrase familiarity breeds contempt. But I, I would flip that and say that separation breeds stigma, which breeds further separation. Uh, because people don't have the incredible opportunity to grow up with someone like Olivia or the thousands of friends that I have with intellectual disabilities, they don't get to see the gift, they don't get to grow into better people themselves. And I think that when we have the opportunity to come together in sport, we take a very complicated problem. The, the history of stigma towards people with intellectual disabilities is thousands of years old. It's very complex, it's cross-cultural. We can find a very simple solution to a very complex problem. It's not let's sit in a room and develop a new policy, it's meet me at center field, meet me on a soccer, field, meet me on a basketball court, we'll come together, and then the familiarity doesn't breed contempt, it sows the seeds for acceptance, it sows the seeds for inclusion. We no longer see each other as this mysterious other, but mm -hmm. as the, the right wing on my soccer team, uh, or the point guard on my basketball team, the person I need to cooperate with, to grow with, uh, to succeed together as we play in sport, but then after the whistle blows, to be together as we succeed in society. Uh, so I think that the the opportunity that I had with her was the, the first seeds of that, uh, but now being able to bring that opportunity to, to other people, whether it's through unified sports, whether it's through engagement, through things like spread the word, uh, we've been able to, to take my experience with Olivia and, and share what I think is the most incredible gift, uh, that, that acceptance, understanding, and, and growth that comes along with being part of the community with intellectual disabilities. So, yeah, fabulous. So, I guess I have a question to all of you. Um, I, I started my career as a teacher. I spent 15 years in public education, and at least in this country and in other countries around the world, uh, sport is not really very important. Um, physical education is not important. In fact, it's getting less and less important. It's not getting more important, it's getting less important. And many countries are putting super high premiums on test scores. M many countries evaluate children exclusively based on scores on a math test or a writing test. Uh, and take no account uh, for sport as a developmental in, uh, pathway. And yet, was, we heard all these people saying freedom and uh, the sense of gratitude and getting better and tolerance and openness are all taught through sport. What could we do if we really think everyone should learn those lessons? What could we do to uh, get the education systems of the world, the, the community-based youth sport, the sport ministries of the world, to shift focus and help us grow sport uh, for all, if you will. What, how can we get that message out, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation, you know, so much, there's always that momentum that goes with, um, you know, kind of that common feeling of it, you know, this is what's going on in the world, so we're gonna go with that. It's right. like a tide. So it's just sort of diverting, you know, the, the water, the momentum, whatever. Um, to you know, really see the importance and the power. I mean, it's, the Special Olympics, I think, does it um, as well or better than anyone else. Any, anything with the Olympic movement, whether it be the, the original Olympics, the Paralympics, Special Olympics, they all inspire people to be a little bit better than they were before. And I'm not sure a math test, you know, I think it's great to acquire that intellect, that uh, ability to figure things out, but at the same time, you know, sports is, is you know, you're using your entire body, not just one organ, right? right? You know, yeah. you're using your entire um, being, really, because it comes out through, you know, everybody um, is on the same playing field, but their personalities separate them. You know, who they are as individuals separate them. Figure skating is a great uh, example of that. But it's, it's sharing that who you are that really builds community more than just being excellent at one thing. Right. You know what I mean? I think people relate to each other better through their differences than they do in what right. Right. Holds them, yeah, the same. Dana, what do you think? How would you, if you were talking to a, a school person and saying, trying to tell them that we should have more inclusive sport as a way of making kids grow up and be healthier and happier, what would you tell them? 
I think we should have more inclusive sport because when I was in school, I'm not very good at math, and math is not <laughs> Me my friend. Me neither. How many people not good at math? <laughs> <laughs> um, reading and writing, and I just did not like school very much, especially in middle school. And on Friday nights, especially in winter, I get to say, oh, I get to go to the hill today. I get to try better and get better at my sport at snowboarding and well, skiing back then, back then in the old days. <laughs> but um, to get excited for the sport was an amazing feeling for me because I knew I could do that, do good at that. And it didn't matter if I fell or I failed the test or anything. I'd still get up and still snowboard. And like um, Scott said, just to, for Special Olympics to be more inclusive would be mean such more so much more to me because mm -hmm. like Hannah Teeter and I we first met in um, the 2013 World Games in South Korea and when I found out that my partner for the first ever unified dual solemn race was Hannah I don't think I breathed for a couple of minutes and the ground was probably shaking because I was jumping so much. Hannah has been my idol ever since she first started um, the half pipe super pipe and for me to be more inclusive would not be just through sports but just all year round um, to meet up and go surfing or go um, for a walk or go swimming or something to be inclusive is the am most amazing feeling for me and athletes exactly like me. It makes us feel more than we are and for the people that are with us to be inclusive, they don't ever let our disability define us. They treat us exactly like they are and for me that's the best feeling in the world. If, if you miss church this morning, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it gets back to that, you know, and uh, self-esteem, yeah. I think, is, is, is such a powerful agent. You know, you think about what it did for you, Jamal. You yeah. think about, you know, what, what it's done for you to be able to, you know, just speak out and change the world we live in. It's being able to kind of step forward and say, I did that. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. And now I can get better. Yeah. Yeah. That, to me, inspires everyone witnessing it. Yeah. It inspires everyone participating in it. Families, friends, communities, they all come together with that. So I think if you're telling the schools, you know, what the value of that is, it's kind of like, well, I understand proficiency, but what about unique yeah. qualities that we all have. And again, I think our, our differences can bring us together. Why should they drive us apart? Yeah. Jamal, you want to? I just say everybody's different. Everybody's different, and God made us all special. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I feel like some people have the research, and some people don't have the research to, for school. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like sports make us inclusive. Mm -hmm. I could be in a classroom with one of my friends growing up in uh, middle school. And you know what I'm saying? He doesn't know that I have a learning disability. Going to football field, and I'm, I look way better than him. He, way he does. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just, man, you're so awesome, man. Like, <laughs> and it just make you feel inclusive. Make yeah. you feel like that's your friend. Yeah. Instead of going to the classroom, and, and, it's, and it's hard to do work in there. Yeah. And, and sometimes you get teased on, you get picked on, because you're not the most smartest person. You know what I'm saying? I feel like uh, when you, you you in the classroom, you want to hang out with the smart people. <laughs> when you on the football, on the on the any sports, you want to hang out with the best sports guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's kind of like so some people just have to. Some people have the resource. Some people have to, like when I growing up, I didn't have the resource for school. You know what I'm saying? I have a teacher that can teach me, mm -hmm. but when I had got a scholarship to go to college, I had all the resource. It was there for me. Mm -hmm. I was in the uh, study hall probably an hour a day getting, getting worked on and it, and it came easy to me. Mm -hmm. 
And that's how I was able to learn. Then I was in high school, but I didn't have that research. I went home after school. And once I went home after school, I played the video games. <laughs> 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 but uh, it's just all about having a good resource. And, uh, but sports make you feel inclusive and yeah. make you feel powerful. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Soren, what, how are we going to get this le message out? Uh, you know, I want to pick up on something that, that Dana said. When she, when she answered the question, you asked her, what would you say to the school administration, to the, the bureaucrat who runs it? Uh, and she gave you, I think, about a seven-word answer and then immediately went into, what would we talk to about with the students? Right. What would we do to make this an inclusive environment, not necessarily from the top down, but from the bottom up? Mm. And I think that sport is so inherently grassroots. Uh, we come up with ways to systematize it. We come up with ways to organize it. Uh, but it's something that just happens spontaneously. And I think that we have an opportunity to have a similar effect with inclusion and creating a more inclusive environment, not working with administrators um, in all the ways that they contribute, uh, but also going straight to young people, straight to the influencers in a middle school hallway, which isn't necessarily the principal. It's, it's Johnny, the cool kid on the football team, mm -hmm. or it's Jimmy or Jane in the classroom. And, and getting to each one of them and saying, you can be a champion for this idea. You can be a champion for this movement. Um, and we've, we've seen it happen. Uh, frankly, we didn't really have permission to start Spread the Word to End the Word. We just we no. went out and found, <laughs> we, we went out and found young people who were passionate about it and said, this is your opportunity to change the world around you in a way that we think that, that you want to see it changed. And, and I think that we've seen in high schools, in middle schools, in elementary schools, where we found these young champions, um, that that catalyst for change is so much more powerful than a school, uh, a team of teachers that's on board, or a principal that's on board, or a superintendent that's on board. Um, so finding, they are out there. Uh, so I think it's our, our task to find them and empower them uh, and watch them change the, the society and the community that they live in. Yeah. So let's shift a little bit and talk about um, young people themselves um, and the way they feel about sport. Most, uh, you, you guys all did really well. I mean, you were good, right? I don't want to say Soren and me <laughs> might not have been, <laughs> had the exact same experience, but let's just, uh, let's just imagine that I was, I was not. I was, I was told I was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> By your wife, I think. Or she that. used to tell you you were awesome <laughs> until today. Um, uh, no, but, but more seriously, there are a lot of people who don't feel they're great in sport. Yeah. Um, do we need to do something different with coaches, with kids, so that sport isn't a place where people get picked on or where sport isn't the place where you feel like if you're not good, you shouldn't play? <laughs> I, I mean, because I think in the end of the day, no one says if you can't read, you shouldn't read. Yeah. But a lot of people do say if you can't run fast, you shouldn't bother playing football. No. How do we change that so that people hear the lesson that you know, what you said, Dana, I mean, you said I didn't care whether I came in first or second. I don't think most coaches <laughs> coach that way. <laughs> I don't think most teachers think that. I don't yeah. think most parents. You're right. they, they don't, they, if they see their kid playing, you know, little soccer game and their kid's not good, they're like, Arr, you know. So how do we change that mentality? How do we teach that everybody should play, not just people who are better than others? I think we should just change it because... Uh, just, just give, give everybody hope, you know what I'm saying? Give everybody a, a confident way they feel good. Mm -hmm. You don't gotta come in first. As long as you, you gave it your all, right. you gave it your best. You work, you work hard at it while you're doing it. That's the only thing I try to teach kids when I do the camp, don't give up. You know what I'm saying? You can, you can be in last place, but once you do it, give it your all, do it with your heart. Uh, and that's one thing I, I try to teach to the young kids because sometimes, uh, Kids with learning disability or kids, regular kids, they, 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 some of them kids give up as well. You know what I'm saying? So you just got to just build them up with confidence, mm. build them up with belief that one day you will be the best that you can ever be. Yeah. Did you ever have a coach that made you feel that way? That it didn't matter that you were the fastest kid in the whole <laughs> I just, country? Uh, <laughs> I just think my auntie. My auntie, she stuck with me. Okay. She was one of the person that stuck with me the best, and she still do to this day. That you know, what I'm saying she she went down this route with me. Mm -hmm. I stayed with her. Uh, with this, we used to go out to school just reading a book, mm -hmm. the Bible, and that's how I got better reading. Mm -hmm. uh, she saw me giving up. She like J Jamal, don't give up. 
-hmm. one day you can be the best and just you just keep working on it re working at it so she built my confidence up mm -hmm. i feel like I, used, I, used, I wasn't always the fastest in my event i was the slowest one in my age group but what took me to the top was i kept working hard i never gave up and that's one thing that i try to teach the kids never give up one day you can be the fast i mean one day you can be the slowest end up being a, and next day you can be, end up being the fastest overnight nice Nice. Did you have a coach, Daniel, that, that made you feel like it didn't matter where you finished, just go for it the way you described it? Or did you just learn that from somewhere else? Oh, in Wisconsin, I have a handful of coaches that, <laughs> um, for my whole life in Special Olympics and out, taught me that um, it's okay not to get first. And believe me, when I was younger, this lip came about that far out if I didn't get first. So <laughs> I've grown up a little since then. <laughs> um, but they taught me that to go much further than trying to win and to congratulate, even though it's super duper hard, to congratulate the first place winner and to also congratulate the last place winner. You are opening doors for those people to show that, oh, she got third place and she's still congratulating me. Maybe I can do better and congratulating, you know, all the people in second and third and fourth and the last place. Maybe I can exceed and do that. And he also taught me that um, when you fall, that don't ever let the ground keep you there just get back up and go way past and never ever give up and to keep going and never let anybody tell you that you're not fast enough or you're too small for snowboarding which I am so <laughs> um, and don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something turn I always think turn into you can't and I to and I can and turn the impossible to always a, a possible so and also that everything is hard everything is difficult at first but if you let that shoot you down then you're never going to make it past impossible if you go over that hard or go over that impossible you're going to make it to impossible and it's going to be an amazing feeling yeah. Coaches, uh, if, you, if this room were a thousand coaches um, from all different countries, what could we say to them to help us create the, uh, have them learn from Jamal and Dane? I mean, what, what, uh, what, what can we do to change that? I mean, am I right in thinking we need to change something here? Yeah, I, I just think that um, it's what, what are the expectations, mm. you know? I grew up in a very small town. I was the sickest kid in my class. I was the smallest kid in my class. And I was a, <laughs> a boy figure skater. There's a <laughs> trifecta for you. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's just um, every coach that really allowed me to advance, it was all about patience, persistence, and, and really learning good technique. It really trying to infuse quality, really trying to show, you know, just believe in this, believe in, in the right path, believe in the, in, there's a correct way of doing something. And I just started teaching skating. And I, I tell my kids, learn it right, and it's your friend for life. Mm. But if you just do it to do it, you're always going to struggle with it. it. It'll betray you at times when you really need it. Mm. So it, it's just about, I've come in first, I've come in last. Mm. You know, it's learning how to allow those last place finishes to allow for that determination and that um, desire to never give up to allow the first places to happen. I always look for the guy that comes in last at Novice Nationals, uh -huh. the, the little boys event, the Novice Nationals, who came in last? And the little boy came in first was like, I came in first. I go, no, no, congratulations, who came in last? <laughs> and I'll meet the guy that came in last, he's like, you're my man, <laughs> you that's where I was. And so just to be able to be a role model, yeah. to be able to be a good example to be able to be positive and to never give up on anybody that's the key to coaching you know just give the best of yourself so the world is really divided right uh, 
in this country, your host country for this particular edition of the Forum of the Goals. Um, in the last six months, there's been more fear and division uh, than probably since I was a little kid. Uh, people are really worried about can we learn to live together, get along. Um, Soren, I'll give you the last word. Uh, it seems like uh, if, if the country could listen to you guys uh, as, as the leaders, we'd have, a different, uh, we'd, we'd have a different platform. What would you say to the nation, uh, to the gathering of nations, if this was the United Nations? Uh, what do we have to teach? I think that, that, I, that I would defer to Tim from last night, uh, who got up on stage, he did the same during our youth summit in the afternoon, uh, looked out at an audience, 99.9% .9 of whom he had never met, and said with the utmost human sincerity, I love you. <laughs> and that was it. And there was no expectation that there would be anything returned to him. There was no, there was no expectation that it was going to go anywhere. It was just him expressing everything that he felt at that moment. And, and finding ways to, to get someone like him to teach that in, in environments where we do find division. And I think it's, it's up, to, up to us, in a way, to, to provide him him a platform, to provide teachers like him a platform, uh, to put that message out there because as much as I'd like to think it would have a similar effect, I think if I got up in front of a stadium of 60,000 people and just screamed out, I love you, I, I don't know. We if love I, you too, Soren. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I honestly have so much to learn from, from yeah. Tim and, uh, and from so many other Special Olympics athletes and other people with intellectual disabilities that I've met, my sister included. So I think that providing them a platform, providing a self-advocacy platform, is, is the best way to bring that sincerity and genuine humanity uh, to, to the highest ears. Jamal, Dana, Soren, Scott, uh, to all of you, Your Excellency, um, uh, this is your opening panel. It's, this is the challenge, I hope, of this edition of the forum. Uh, this is the beginning, I hope, of a great collaboration where we can extend the lessons of Tim um, and the lessons of these pictures. Imagine these pictures on the covers of textbooks uh, in sporting clubs around the world. Imagine if when you walked into your local community center uh, in, in any country that you're from and you saw these photographs as the icons of sport. Uh, maybe someday with our collaboration we will achieve that. Thank you all for this fantastic panel. In recognition of Eunice Kennedy Shriver's vision in creating an awareness for young people with intellectual disabilities, and now under his leadership, developing Special Olympics into a thriving global social movement, ladies and gentlemen, um, Doha Goals would like to present this gift to Tim Shriver, symbolizing our appreciation of his outstanding efforts. I'll now kindly request His Excellency Sheikh Faisal, to please come forward and recognize Tim for his outstanding contribution to social impact.